Hello, I'm Professor John Blakeman from the UW-Stevens Point Political Science Department, and I'd like to welcome you back to my ongoing lecture series on the U.S. Constitution, sponsored by the UWSP Alumni Association and the Alumni College Experience. So do you ever wake up in the middle of the night wondering, can Congress create a national bank? If so, can a state tax the national bank? Whatever happened to Alexander Hamilton's National Bank from, eight, from 1790? Well, if those questions keep you awake at night, you'll find the answers in this case, McCullough versus Maryland. So I present to you McCullough versus Maryland. Um, to 1790 and Alexander Hamilton's economic plan. And if you have seen the musical Hamilton, which I have not, and I, I would absolutely love to see it, um, part, of that, part of that musical is about Alexander Hamilton's economic plan and how he's trying to convince George Washington and Washington's cabinet to adopt it. <clears throat> McCullough versus Maryland deals with one of the aspects of that. Now, um, the, uh, the Hamilton plan, in a sense. It has several components to it, and I think it's worth talking about just briefly to put McCullough versus Maryland into some kind of perspective. One thing Hamilton does is he writes his famous report on manufacturers. I said famous. You haven't heard of it? Well, yeah, most people haven't, and that's okay. But the report on manufacturers is actually pretty significant because it's an attempt to convince the federal government back in 1790 to come up with a comprehensive plan to develop manufacturing in the United States. Hamilton also argues that the US government needs to create a national bank. And a national bank would allow the US government to deposit its revenue and pay its bills from a financial institution that it controls. Um, from 1789 through 1790, 1791, the U.S. government had to rely on the state banking system to deposit revenue and pay bills. Also, Hamilton argues for the national government to issue national bonds and to pay off the war debts from the state governments. And as Hamilton saw it in 1790, there's no national currency yet. The US dollar, the famous greenback, really hasn't been invented. And a national bond system would cre help create a national currency. Anyway, so the Bank of the United States, that's what we're gonna focus on now. It was introduced into Congress. It was approved by Congress in 1791, signed by President Washington and it has a 20-year charter, which means that it will expire automatically in 1811 unless it's renewed. And that's exactly what happens. The National Bank expires. Congress, which is now partly controlled by the Jeffersonian Republicans, refuse to renew it, but, but only by one vote. The vote is really, really close, obviously. The Jeffersonian Republicans oppose the National Bank, and private banks are opposed to it as well. The Jeffersonian Republicans, remember, are an classic anti-federalists. They're really focused on states' rights. And as they see it, Congress does not have the authority to create a national bank. It's not in the Constitution. The bank, however, is renewed by Congress in 1816, signed into law by President James Madison. And this comes after the economic crisis brought about by the War of 1812, where the federal government and states incurred a lot of debt to enter a war with the British. <clears throat> the U.S. government actually had to borrow money from state banks. And that's not necessarily a good financial position for the U.S. government to be in. So momentum built to renew the National Bank for another term, which is what happened. This time around, states weren't exactly in agreement with it. And so one state, Maryland, passes a law allowing it to tax any bank operating within its borders that is not chartered by the state of Maryland. And of course, there's only one bank operating in Maryland that does not have a Maryland state charter, and that's the National Bank of the United States. And so Maryland submits a tax bill 
to the treasurer of the National Bank in the branch operating in Baltimore, um, Mr. McCullough. And McCullough, or more importantly, the U.S. government, refuses to pay the tax bill. So this leads to the big showdown, McCullough versus Maryland. Basically, two questions that the Supreme Court focuses on. The first is very basic. Does Congress have the power to charter a national bank? If so, where is it in the Constitution? Or more specifically, where is it in Article I, Section 8? Remember, that's the article of the Constitution that spells out the powers of Congress. Question number two, can a state tax a federal institution? Well, Maryland, as we will see, says, of course we can. It's our territory. Our people are sovereign. We can tax whatever we want. We'll see that the Supreme Court doesn't necessarily buy that argument. So let's briefly take a look at Article 1, Section 8. I apologize for the small print. Uh, I really couldn't do it any other way. But Article 1, Section 8, remember, spells out the powers of Congress. And as you read through it, you are not going to find an explicit, clear power to charter a national bank. And in fact, you're not going to find a clear power to charter a corporation either. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are a lot of other powers here. Congress has the power to borrow money on the credit of the U.S., regulate commerce. We'll come back to that one later. Uh, establish rules of naturalization, coin, money establishes post offices and roads on and on and on and on and on and on. Pay careful attention to the very last clause in Article 1, Section 8. Congress shall have power, reading from the top, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. That's what we call the necessary and proper clause. And in McCullough versus Maryland, that clause is very, very important. And we will see, we might get hung up on what this one little word necessary means. Okay, so let me switch to the case real quick and we'll get underway. So here's the case, McCullough versus Maryland. I'll start at the top for you. And, you know, like Marbury versus Madison, it, it's complex. And it's a little hard to read. No question about that. But uh, if we pay attention to the highlighted sections, um, that might help us quite a bit, hopefully. So let's start at the beginning here. Um, Marshall jumps right to the first question, Chief Justice Marshall. The first question is, has Congress the power to incorporate a bank? Now, we're going to see Marshall is going to get sidetracked along the way here, but that's okay, because it's sort of interesting how he does get sidetracked. But he says, and this I, I think this is important, the principle now can set the question, can Congress create a bank? It was introduced at a very early period of our history. He's talking about 1790. And he says, the power now contested, the power to charter a bank, was exercised by the first Congress under the Constitution. The bill for incorporating the bank did not steal upon an unsuspecting legislature and pass unobserved. Its principle was, uh, was completely understood. It was debated. You know, he goes on to say that some of the brightest minds in the country debated it and passed it. Some of the people who wrote the Constitution debated it and passed it. So in a sense, he's reminding us that we've been here before, that we have dealt with this question. And Congress in 1790, and again in 1816, thought that the National Bank was constitutional. Now think back for a second. You know, one of the early lectures I gave on constitutional interpretation, and we talked about coordinate construction of the Constitution about how each of the national branches and the states for that matter interpret the constitution themselves that's exactly what's going on here congress interpreted the constitution in 1790 to allow it to create a national bank and it did that again in 1816 
Ah, but Marshall points out an interesting question here. Here's Maryland interpreting the Constitution and trying to sidetrack us a little bit. Maryland says, well, we think this is an important question that the construction of the Constitution, its interpretation, uh, that the instrument emanated from the sovereign and independent states, not from the people of the United States. So Maryland says, yeah, the Constitution, it should be interpreted in the context of it, the Constitution, coming from the sovereign and independent states and not from the people of the United States. And you might be thinking, why is this question important? Why does this matter? Well, we might find the answer to that. John Marshall quickly disposes with that. He says, it would be difficult to sustain this proposition. As he sees it, and you can sort of read through his argument, uh, the government proceeds directly from the people. It is ordained and established in the name of the people. Uh, it is ordained, this is straight out of the preamble, right? Ordained to form a more perfect union on and on and on. Yes, the assent of the states in their sovereign capacity is implied, but it was the people of the United States that approved the Constitution, not the sovereign and independent states. And he goes on to say that the government of the Union, though limited in its powers, is supreme within its sphere of action. We do have a government of limited power and authority, no question about that. But as Marshall sees it, the power given to the national government is supreme, and supreme in the national government's sphere of action. And he says, this isn't guesswork, it's not left to reason, the people of the United States in express terms said so. The Constitution and the laws of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. Now, this question, does the Constitution come from the states or does it come from the people? You know, we probably don't really settle it until the end of the Civil War. But as John Marshall sees it, it comes from the people of the United States. And the people made quite clear that their national government was going to be supreme. Now, he jumps back to the National Bank. See, he got sidetracked for a second, right? But he jumps back to the National Bank. He says, okay, okay. Among the enumerated powers, the powers written down in Article 1, Section 8, we do not find that power of establishing a national bank or creating a corporation. And so he admits that up front. There's no clear power for Congress to do this. But he says there is no phrase in the instrument, the Constitution, which excludes incidental or implied powers. This is really, really important because the Supreme Court's telling us that the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, yes, it spells out the powers of Congress in express terms, what we call express powers but there are also implied powers, powers that are not written down and they are implied from the express powers. This is a complex argument. Marshall says, uh, if we go to the Articles of Confederation, remember the articles preceded this constitution. The articles did not work, they failed. And he says in the Articles of Confederation, there was a clause that excluded implied powers. And he, he implies himself that the framers of the Constitution knew that in Philadelphia in 1788, which they certainly did. And so when they wrote the new Constitution, they did not constrain the powers of Congress like under the Articles of Confederation. You know, this is where historical context and original intent can start to come into the picture, for sure. All right. Now, this is a very important phrase in the case and in American constitutional law in itself. You know, Marshall has told us that Congress has implied powers. And he says, 
a constitution to contain an accurate detail of all the subdivisions of which his great powers will admit and of all the means that they can be used, it would be a legal code. It would be so detailed that people could not understand it. It could not be embraced by the human mind. It would not be understood by the public. The nature of a constitution is that its great outlines should be marked, its important objects designated, and basically the political institutions fill in the gaps. And so Marshall is telling us how we ought to be thinking about the Constitution. It's a broad outline. The broad powers of Congress are written down, marked out. The important objects of the national government, peace, security, general welfare, are written down. But the details have to be filled in as we go. And he says, we must never forget it is a constitution we are expounding, that it is a broadly written document with only its great outlines marked out. So he gets back to the powers of Congress. Among the enumerated powers, we do not find the word bank or incorporation. That's true, you can't quibble with that. But we do find the power to lay and collect taxes, to borrow money, to regulate commerce, declare and conduct war, on and on and on. And we find a government entrusted with ample power that the due execution of which the happiness and prosperity of the nation depends. We find a government that is given ample power to work for the prosperity of the nation. And he gives us a little example here, which I think is sort of interesting. <clears throat> Excuse me. The exigencies of the nation may require the treasure. By treasure, he means uh, revenue, taxes. Treasure raised in the north should be transported to the south. That raised in the east conveyed to the west. Or that this order should be reversed. What he's talking about, in a real sense, is the national government has to build and operate a national revenue system. And it will be the case that revenue raised in one part of the country will be used in another part of the country. That's how the government works towards the happiness and prosperity of the nation, as John Marshall sees it. So, let's move on. You know, he's, he's told us, he's admitted, yes, 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 uh, Congress does not have the clear authority to create a national bank. But it's in the Constitution. And he says, the government which has a right to do something must, according to the dictates of reason, be allowed to select the means. So think about it like this. What Marshall is getting at is the government has the right and the power to lay and collect taxes, to spend revenue to work towards national prosperity. And if it has those powers, it must be allowed to select the means of using those powers, of putting those powers into effect. And John Marshall tells us this isn't left to guesswork because it's right here. The Constitution of the United States has not left the right of Congress to employ the necessary means for the execution of the powers conferred on the government to general reasoning. It is written down that Congress has the power to make all laws, all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution its foregoing powers. So think about it like this. Article 1, Section 8, to go back to that, it spells out in detail the powers of Congress, in detail. And then we get to the very end, the last clause in Article 1, Section 8, which is the necessary and proper clause. And Chief Justice Marshall says it is this clause that allows Congress to use necessary means to execute or bring about or use all of the powers listed above. And it's not left to guesswork. It's written down. Now, 
a good bit of lawyering here by the state of Maryland. This is where we get hung up on what that one little word necessary means. And, you know, I'm, I love talking about this, this with my students in class. You know, the, we all, myself included, we all find it mind-boggling, hard to comprehend, that the outcome of a constitutional case, the outcome of a major public policy, sort of hinges on one word in the Constitution and how we interpret that one word. So, the state of Maryland says, well, necessary means uh, those things that are only absolutely physically necessary. I think what Maryland is arguing is necessary, the, the word as it's used in the Constitution basically means Congress has no other choice. That if, if Congress finds it necessary to do something, it means Congress has no other alternative. The thing to be done, the public policy to be put into effect is absolutely physically necessary. Now think about what Maryland's up to here. If Maryland wins this argument, that one little word necessary is now interpreted very, very restrictively. And from a state's rights point of view, that's exactly what you want. Now, John Marshall, of course, the Federalist says, is this the sense in which the word necessary is always used? All right, so let's spend, well, I edited this opinion for you, so it's more like 10 pages of the real opinion focusing on one tiny word. Ah, it's a lot of effort, it may well be worth it. Is it true that the word necessary is always used in this restrictive sense? It always means an absolute physical necessity so strong that one, an absolute physical necessity so strong that one thing to which another may be termed necessary cannot exist without the other. Sorry, there's a typo in there I just realized. We think it does not. And he goes on to say, uh, where are we here? Here we go. A thing may be necessary, very necessary, absolutely or indispensably necessary. To no mind would the same idea be conveyed by these several phrases. The word necessary is not a fixed character. It admits all degrees of comparison. So Chief Justice Marshall has made it quite clear the word necessary is not narrowly interpreted at all. He makes uh, another interesting argument too, that what we're talking about is the execution of the great powers by Congress on which the welfare of the nation depends. It must have been the intention of those who gave these powers. There's an, or an original intent argument. The intention of those who gave these powers to ensure, as far as human prudence could ensure, their beneficial execution. And I think what Marshall means is the framers of the Constitution meant that the powers of, the con the powers of Congress would be used beneficially and they would be used broadly. They would not confine or limit the choice of means that Congress can use narrowly. Okay, so Marshall says, but consider this. Um, the necessary and proper clause. The clause is placed among the powers of Congress, not among the limitations on those powers. So think back to that constitutional roadmap in an earlier lecture. Article 1, Section 8 spells out the powers of Congress. Article 1, Section 9 limits the powers of Congress. And the necessary and proper clause is in Article 1, Section 8. It's at the very end. It's placed among the powers of Congress, not among the limits on Congress. 
And so it, when we get to constitutional interpretation again, you know, remember Marshall in, in Marbury tells us about the importance of phraseology and where words are located within the text of the document. And the necessary and proper clause is located in Article One, Section 8, the, the section that spells out congressional power. It is not located in Article One, Section 9, which limits congressional power. So the clause, as he sees it, as the court sees it, is meant to enlarge, not diminish government power. This sort of gets us into the, back to that argument about implied powers, powers that are not written down. And as Marshall sees it, as the courts see it, those implied powers come from, to a large extent, the necessary and proper clause. All right, I'm going to skip ahead here. Um, but in essence, the, the court concludes that Congress has the power to create the national bank. It has the power to charter a corporation like a bank. It has the power to give certain economic powers to the national bank. That power is implied. And it comes from Congress's great powers, written down in Article I, Section 8, to raise revenue and spend money being considered merely as a means to be employed for the purpose into carrying into execution the given powers, there could be no motive for particularly mentioning it. And what Marshall is pointing out there is basically the bank itself is a means. It's a means to, to, for Congress to bring about its great powers written down in Article I, Section 8. And the necessary and proper clause allows Congress to choose the means to use, the means to employ when it wants to exercise one of its explicit powers. Okay, one final argument that Maryland raises, this is the real states' rights argument too. The state of Maryland, can it tax the branch of the national bank? The larger question might be, can a state tax or regulate a federal institution that operates within its territory? Now, Maryland makes a, a fairly straightforward argument. You know, Maryland says that, hey, this is our territory. Our citizens have decided that the, the state of Maryland will regulate and tax any bank not chartered by the state of uh, the state of maryland our citizens have spoken through our representatives and within the state of maryland our citizens are sovereign especially when it comes to the taxing authority now the supreme court doesn't necessarily disagree with that you know chief justice marshall agrees that yes maryland citizens are sovereign and Maryland has the power to tax. It has the power to tax on behalf of its people. And Marshall says the sovereignty of a state extends to everything which exists by its own authority or is introduced by its permission. Yeah, there's no question about that. But further down, Marshall says, but if we allow this, if we, if we agree that, that the people of one state can regulate a federal institution within their state, if we apply the principle, we shall find it capable of changing totally the character of the national constitution. We shall find it capable of arresting or limiting all the measures of the government and prostrating it at the foot of the states. That is, if you allow the people of one state to regulate a federal institution within their state, you are allowing the people of that state to limit the power of the federal government. And Marshall says, the American people have declared in their constitution and the laws made pursuance thereof that it's supreme 
That's the supremacy clause in Article 6, remember. That the people of the nation spoke. The Constitution comes from the people of the United States, not from the sovereign and independent states. And the people of the United States agreed to Article 6 of the Constitution. They agreed that the Constitution and all laws made under it are supreme. So actually, Marshall brings us back around to that question we thought was distracting, right? Where does the Constitution come from? Maryland says it comes from the states. The Supreme Court says no, it comes from the people of the United States. And the people of the United States made it quite clear that it is supreme and that the will of the nation is supreme. And Marshall concludes by saying, when a state taxes the operations of the government of the United States, it acts upon institutions created not by their own constituents or by the people of their state, but by people over whom they claim no control. It acts upon the measures of a government created by others, as well as themselves, for the benefit of others in common with themselves. So when a state taxes the operations of the federal government within the state, within that state, that state and the people of that state are imposing their will on the people of the nation. And for Marshall, that is simply too much to bear. That is not accurate. The Constitution comes from the people of the United States. Therefore, no state can tax a federal institution operating within it. And we could probably extend that principle so that no state can regulate a federal institution operating within it. Because that federal institution represents the will of the people of the United States, not necessarily the will of the people of one state. Now embedded in this opinion, and I've skipped over it as a a very famous phrase that I'm sure you've heard. The power to tax is the power to destroy. And what John Marshall means by that is a state government can literally use its taxing authority to drive businesses out of business, to destroy certain economic life and economic gain. And Marshall warns us about that. The power to tax is the power to destroy. So we're not going to let the power of the people of Maryland to tax. We're not going to let them use that power to destroy a national institution. Okay, it's an interesting opinion. You know, what we take away from it, I think, is this understanding of the necessary and proper clause, which is that Congress has implied powers that aren't necessarily written down. Now, from a Federalist perspective, this helps create a strong national government that can build a strong national economy. From an anti-Federalist perspective, uh, they're certainly concerned, states like Maryland are certainly concerned about the idea that Congress has unwritten implied powers. So let's leave it at that. Thanks for watching.